don't listen to me. I think I'm the president, they don't care. <laughs> welcome to UC, welcome to uh, our speaker series. It's great to be able to host a wide variety of uh, speakers and programs uh, for you. Uh, the format, for those of you who know, is uh, I hope there's some pieces of paper or cards that uh, you have that you can write out questions, and uh, we'll have ushers who pick up the questions and bring them to me, and at the end of the speaker's comments, uh, I'll ask questions of the speaker, as uh, many, either as many as you write or as many as we have time to ask. And we'll do our best by that as we can. I encourage you, if you have something noisy in your possession, like a beeper or like a cell phone, to encourage uh, you to turn that off. And then we'll be in uh, great shape. Uh, I want to give a special word of thank you to Terry Robb and Rob Wilt Advisors, because uh, they've assisted us and supported our having the program tonight. So. Terry's a great alumnus of uh, Morris Art College, University of Charleston, so thanks so much. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, uh, are working on uh, innovation at the University of Charleston, and so we're building that uh, innovation building out there to make a difference in uh, how students understand themselves and what they are prepared to do as graduates. And in studying innovation, I've come to understand that you need to have an environment that supports uh, innovation. Well, the lead-in that I have out of all of that is to say that what we're here to talk about tonight has to do with the economic environment which surrounds us and uh, shapes much of our thinking and thought and uh, much of the concerns that I hear expressed sometimes uh, in many, many venues, but particularly here in West Virginia. Our speaker is Mark Lucini. He is the Chief Investment Strategist of the Investment Strategy Group. So Investment Strategist, but also is the President and Chief Investment Officer of Janney Capital Management. So he wears two very different hats. As the Chief Investment Strategist, he serves as the firm's investment expert and spokesperson offering national market commentary and developing asset allocation models and investment strategies. He holds a bachelor's degree and an MBA from Gannon University, and he's here to help us understand something about uh, that economic environment in uh, which we live, and he says that uh, he will make that uh, clear and he will be candid and uh, very, very helpful to us. So it's a pleasure to welcome him. So thanks to Terry Robb, and welcome to Mark Lucini. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Obviously, I uh, had some pretty stiff competition with this Chamber of Commerce evening that you have here in Charleston. Uh, spectacular day, evening, and uh, what a setting here at this beautiful campus at the University of Charleston. Uh, stunning, and given the uh, forum that uh, Terry Robb and I just had uh, with the president of the university and some of the things that the school is undertaking relative to innovation, trying to prepare students for the next generation of work life, whatever that's going to entail, sounds pretty exciting and remarkable, and it's a real gem for all of you uh, living here in the uh, West Virginia and Charleston area. Uh, as was said, I'm going to talk about a number of things this evening and then field questions because invariably I'm going to not make mention of something that was the sole purpose for you to come here tonight. And you'll call me out for that, of course. Um, and I also understand that in this speaker series of many, many luminaries, uh, one Aaron Brockovich and Jack Hanna from the Columbus Sioux were previous speakers. And so I know I pale in comparison and stature uh, and maybe looks, uh, relative to some of the speaker bureau that uh, you've had the occasion to witness here. But uh, I'll try to hold up our end of the bargain and uh, sound reasonably informed relative to what it is that uh, I think we know at uh, Janie Montgomery Scott, and at least what in our judgment is going on on a macroeconomic level, distill that down into the financial markets, uh, try to make some sense of what's going on in the stock and bond markets, 
and at the end of the day, maybe leave you with some takeaways relative to what you might think about on a personal level, relative to how you're entertaining your own investment assets. Um, the title of this evening's presentation was actually developed a couple of months ago when global economic conditions were quite fragile. And that's why its uh, tagline had uh, a, a phrase in there, unstable economy. Uh, and what were the reasons for that? Well, you know, remember, we were coming out of the back of 2015, and uh, we found out that growth in the fourth quarter of 2015 actually slowed from an already relative and under-trend, underwhelming pace of economic growth that the, the country has elicited since the end of the Great Recession in June of 2009. In addition to that, the Federal Reserve, for the first time in almost 10 years, raised interest rates in the middle of December, and uh, the delayed reaction to that interest rate increase was for the markets to sell off rather dramatically, such that by the end of the January period, we had had what we could call, in fact, the worst start to a year in stock market history. Uh, in addition to that, uh, China, the world's second largest economy, which had been experiencing decelerating growth for some time, gave no witness to the fact that they were able to, even after several stimulative efforts on the part of their central bank to try to reflate economic activity, arrest their slowdown. And as a consequence of that, all other emerging market economies that are hinged off of China's growth and China's enormous appetite since it consumes about 50% of, of everything that comes out of the ground, whether it be food or rocks, uh, was having backdraft implications to other emerging market countries. And you might say, well, what do these emerging market countries have to do with the U.S., and why would that impart some kind of negative impulse to the U.S. economy? Well, it's because 57% of global economic activity germinates from emerging markets, including China. So they matter a lot to global economic activity. Coming back to the U.S. as a consequence of the fact that our central bank, the Federal Reserve, is on a path that is divergent from most other central banks around the world, which is to say they were moving toward tightening monetary policy. They raised interest rates in December when other central banks around the world were loosening monetary policy by lowering interest rates and in some cases imparting negative interest rates in their economies to try to stimulate economic activity. It resulted in our currency, the U.S. dollar, strengthening rather dramatically. In fact, the U.S. dollar had risen against our trading partners around the world by 25% over the course of just 18 months. And that bludgeoned our industrial complex here in the United States, most of which have some component of their business that rely on export activity. And the strength of the dollar is a headwind to that export activity, which gave reason for some CEOs of industrial companies around the United States to say that the U.S. coming out of the end of the fourth quarter of last year into the first quarter of 2016 was in an industrial recession, which is to say they were under such tremendous pressure as a consequence of soft or weakening economic growth in markets that they sell their products to and or the consequences of the headwind of the strength of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis those end markets whose currencies are cheapened against the strengthening U.S. dollar was a one-two punch uh, to the stomach of these enterprises' businesses, and the, as a consequence, their profitability uh, was quite grim. And lo and behold, as these things are wont to do, we started to see some nascent signs of a turn. Now, along the way, we at Janie Montgomery Scott had had the view that while the odds of a recession in the United States were higher in 2016 than 2015, we still thought that that probability was extremely low, a one in four chance or less that we saw a recession in 2016. So while at times it looked a little bleak in January and February, as we did see some softening in economic news that was coming out about manufacturing activity, as I alluded to earlier, even in the services industry, which is about 85% of businesses across the country. We saw some diminution in confidence levels among CEOs from companies big to small as hiring plans were beginning to soften as a consequence of dampening animal spirits. All these things collectively were conspiring to give rise to the notion that we might be coming closer 
to a recession, that the odds among some pundits were increasing to 50% or greater, that the U.S. was going to succumb to this soft or weakening global growth and that we weren't necessarily immune from, even though export activity is just 13% of U.S. overall economic activity, but that, again, that lack of immunity meant that we were going to feel the pain washing ashore here in the United States that other countries around the world were experiencing. We didn't hold that view. Yes, we understood that we were going to be vulnerable to some degree, but we felt that the U.S. economy had enough momentum, had enough inertia, coming out of what is now six and three quarters years of economic growth subsequent to the end of the recession, and the fundamental underpinnings of that growth were sufficiently strong to suggest that the U.S. could overcome weaker global economic conditions and continue to post positive economic growth. And we were right. And so what we saw was now, with the benefit of hindsight, this soft patch of economic data here in the United States evaporate, recede, to where now the news has improved. Is it great? Certainly not. As evidenced by today's announcement from one of the international bodies that makes forecasts about global economic activity, among other things, two times a year. That institution is known as the International Monetary Fund, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And today they made an announcement relative to their forecast for growth globally uh, for the balance of 2016, and they took down their forecast for economic activity from what was 3.4% expected as recent as their last forecast release in November of last year to now 3.2%. 3.2% global economic growth is subpar. Global economic activity of the last quarter century has grown, grown closer to 5% on an annual basis, not 3.2%. Much of that has to do with the slowdown in the emerging market complex, but some of it has to do with some lost momentum, not only here in the United States, but also in Japan, the world's third largest economy, where the International Monetary Fund expects Japan to barely eke out positive economic growth in 2016, and in fact, probably fall back into recession in 2017 if Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan decides to go forward with another increase in their value-added tax. Uh, so, jury's still out on that. Our suspicion is he's unlikely to do that, but nonetheless, that factors into the International Monetary Fund's forecast. So, lo and behold, in this context of tepid economic growth globally, uh, we think the U.S., as I had mentioned, is likely to continue to post positive uh, economic activity, primarily because of one thing. The key to a self-sustaining expansion in the U.S. economy is job growth job gains, job creation, and we're seeing that. The unemployment rate in the United States peaked at 10% after the end of the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, in October of 2009. Subsequent to that point in time, the unemployment rate has been halved. Today it stands at 5%, and I think it's likely to continue to work lower. We've regained the majority of the jobs that were lost in the aftermath of the financial crisis, and the number of industries that are creating jobs on balance continue to expand. So it's not something that is just being done by one or two industries, but rather a broad and broadening number of industries are creating new jobs. So that's good news, because if you have a job and or you recently acquired a job, it typically will help to boost confidence, which is important psychologically to boost consumer spending. And since consumer spending or consumption is what drives 70% of economic activity in the United States, any forecast about U.S. economic growth has to begin with a litmus test of the state of the consumer. And as I mentioned, with low and falling unemployment, which is a good news story, coupled with the fact that we see the initial jobs claims, the weekly claims that come out every Thursday morning and are reported at 8.30 as to the amount of those individuals who recently lost their job and uh, applied at their local unemployment office for insurance claims. That number of around 265 to 270,000 on a weekly basis remains near 40-year lows. In fact, the average amount of those numbers, those claim numbers that should have showed up at the, at the unemployment office during the month of February and March, the average number of those is the lowest in 43 years. 
So while necessarily companies in the United States, big and small, aren't on a hiring binge, at the same time, they're also not releasing workers from the employment ranks at a particularly vigorous level by any stretch of imagination. So that combination, and in fact, it's the weekly jobless claims that are a leading indicator to economic activity as opposed to the jobs report that comes out once a month, which is a, a lagging indicator that leads us to believe that labor conditions are firm and firming in the United States, which is an important contribution to our forecast as to why we think we're going to see continued positive economic growth. The one missing ingredient from the employment marketplace has been wage gains for quite some time. In fact, almost a mystery to governmental and monetary officials as to why we haven't seen that. And the contribution typically is given to the fact that we have still so much slack in the labor market that employers have all the leverage. Employees lack any, and therefore, it wasn't going to result in wage gains until recent. And over the past three and four months, we've consistently seen accompanying the Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly report on job growth that we've seen wage gains occurring at about a 2.2% annualized pace. And given today's current rate of inflation of 1% to 2%, depending upon what methodology that you measure it with, given the, the government's calculation or others, it suggests that real wage gains, in other words, gains over and above that which is lost due to the rising prices through inflation, um, is positive, which is important. And what we expect to see, particularly as the unemployment rate is at 5% and may even push lower here over the balance of 2016, is to see those wage gains that are occurring increase over time. Uh, which would, again, only help to be another variable that reinforces the, the self-cycling of uh, the consumer spending behavior that we need to power positive economic growth in the United States. That has helped to boost consumer confidence. Consumer confidence levels taken today by surveys offered through the Conference Board or the University of Michigan that are published on a monthly basis show that levels of consumer confidence are back to pre-recession levels, back to 2000. And eight levels, which again is a good sign and, and a potential source of why we believe that, that the likelihood, given the uh, ability to spend, um, is going to continue to occur at a reasonable, pa reasonable pace to allow for this positive economic condition to persist. Uh, along with that, because stock prices have risen more than 200% since the lows of 2009, and importantly, since two thirds of all households own a home, where less than 50% own stocks. Housing prices have recovered in some markets, all and then some, of that which was lost during the housing meltdown in 2008, 2009. Some haven't fully recovered yet, but clearly on the path toward that. And that combination of rising financial assets along with home prices has contributed to today a phenomenon where household net worth in the United States, and household net worth is simply taking your assets, subtracting what liabilities you have, what you're, what you're left with is your net worth. That net worth value in the aggregate across everybody in the United States today stands at about $83 trillion, which is more than 20% higher than when it last peaked in October of 2007, before the recession. So again, the wherewithal to spend is there. Consumers have repaired their balance sheets. Debt as a percentage of household income is back down to near 20-year lows, and the service costs of debt, given the low interest rate policy that our Federal Reserve has engineered, also has made the service costs of what debt households have today the lowest we've seen in more than two decades. That confluence of factors are what we believe are, is so important to profiling a picture for the consumer that's quite healthy, quite robust, and likely, if we continue to see the kind of job growth occurring that we've seen in the recent past, which is at that 150 to 200,000 or more a month, which is, which is sufficiently high to continue to provide two, two and a half percent economic growth, is likely to continue to uh, persist and cycle forward in a positive fashion. So on balance, what we're looking for is uh, still somewhat subdued but positive U.S. economic growth in the context of a global economy that has experienced some, soften experienced some softening uh, economic conditions. 
Uh, the good news is that major economic blocks like the Euro area is growing positively, actually a little bit above trend at about one and a half to one and three quarters percent, which is quite strong for the Euro area. In addition to that, we're seeing tentative green shoots, uh, tentative signs, if you will, that China's uh, economy has uh, started to uh, rest its slowdown, if not even reaccelerate somewhat. Some news on the manufacturing front in China, other news on expanding money supply, which ought to loosen credit conditions, news that es excavator sales, of all things, which is, a, if you will, a byproduct of infrastructure spending, has gone vertical in China. So as we look around and try to tease out various things that we might use to interpret what's happening in China, uh, it's our belief that they have, at least for the time being, uh, stalled uh, the slowing pace of economic growth at a level that ought to be sufficiently strong to allow uh, their contribution to global economic uh, growth uh, be sustained at its current levels, if not maybe even improve somewhat over the, uh, over the balance of 2016. Do we think that China is going to reaccelerate to 10 plus percent growth rates like we saw in the entire decade of 2000 and 2010? Absolutely not. They went from a two trillion dollar economy in 2000 to a 10 trillion dollar economy by the end of the decade. To put it in perspective, the U.S. is a 17 trillion dollar economy today. So exceedingly rapid growth uh, from an emerging country that's not likely to be repeated over the next decade. But their stated target of six to six and a half percent growth is something that we believe that they can engineer successfully uh, given the opportunities that they have uh, to invest in more of a consumer driven economy which they're attempting to rebalance to and away from an investment driven economy. So uh, given that picture, uh, which I think uh, expresses a view that suggests that uh, we're likely to remain in a somewhat sluggish but positive uh, growth environment. What does it mean for financial markets? Well, certainly the U.S. equity market has had its trials and tribulations, and you've had to, if you've been watching it regularly, like I know some would want to do, and might suggest for some of you, you're probably watching it too much, um, <laughs> is you probably had to drop you know, drama means every once in a while because it's feeling like on any given day you're on a roller coaster, up 150, down 250, and day over day, quite frankly, we even say amongst ourselves, nothing's changed. There is no reason for the market to have gone up 200 or been bid down 200. There's no fundamental change in 24 hours in global economic activity that would warrant that kind of volatility. But it's really an expression of uncertainty that's driving the market's volatility. And this is not new. In fact, we started to see some deterioration in the market as early as May of last year when the market peaked. The high point in the U.S. equity market, the all-time high, was established on May 21st of 2015. We tend to use the S&P 500 index as a proxy for the stock market rather than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but at that point, the S&P 500 reached 2,130 on a closing basis on that date. Today it closed at 2060, a uh, little bit up on the course of 2016's reporting period, but still down from its all-time high uh, back in May of last year. And along the way, we encountered serious volatility. In fact, in August of last year, we had the first correction, which in our industry is defined as a decline in price of 10% or more in the stock market. We had the first one in more than four years. What was unusual about that correction was not that we had one, it's the fact that we had gone four years without one. That was the longest period in market history, or excuse me, one of the longest periods in market history without having had a correction of that significance. So what is more common is that they occur more frequently than they have. So that only made it even more of an exaggerated moment in time since we were lulled into a certain complacency into thinking that the market doesn't do that anymore, and in fact it did and did again in February of this year. Uh, but again, we think it's an attribution to the level of uncertainty investors have right now because of the cross currents at the moment, uh, which include economic activity, which is to say, yes, uh, it's positive. Uh, yes, other economies around the world are growing, not all. Clearly, Brazil is a basket case. Uh, its economy is collapsing at an annualized rate of about 6% a year right now, and they're talking about impeaching uh, Dilma Rousseff, uh, the president of Brazil. Russia's economy is contracting for a lot of reasons, 
attributed to the decline in oil prices as well as the, san the sanctions that have been imposed on it. So it's not uniform that every country around the world is, is growing, but most of the economically important ones are. Um, but in that, in that context, there are other features of the marketplace that are troubling for investors. And one is the fact that I mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve decided to raise interest rates for the first time. Uh, and the question was not whether the market was going to worry about one quarter of 1% increase in interest rates, but rather what was the trajectory of subsequent increases likely to look like? And at what point could interest rates engineered by the Federal Reserve having raised them with some level of frequency reach a level that would actually threaten stock prices because if interest rates get to a point where you can earn that a rate of return on bonds or other short-term fixed income instruments, that is relatively attractive, then why expose yourself to the uncertainty and the volatility of owning stocks? So it becomes competition for stocks when stocks for the longest time haven't had any competition because there's been 0% yields on cash. So back in December, the Federal Reserve came out and they have what they call, or we call the dot plot, which is a, a matrix of Federal Reserve members' views as to where they think interest rates are going to go, and they said, we think we're going to hike interest rates four times in 2016. Well, lo and behold, just in March of this year, when they had another regularly scheduled Federal Open Market Committee meeting, those same members took down those expectations from four to two, realizing that they were ambitious, but it also is a testament to the fact that monetary officials the wonks in Washington, D.C., and those Federal Reserve presidents from the 12 districts around the country who have access to all the information that you might imagine you could ever get, still get it wrong, and can get it wrong in as, in as short of a period as just two months. That tells you about the uncertainty that lurks out there. But at the same time, you have central banks like the Bank of Japan lowering interest rates into negative territory which, by the way, was not unprecedented because the European Central Bank already did that. And in fact, Sweden is the one that really takes the trophy. Uh, Sweden has the oldest central bank in the world, and today they host interest rates of negative 1.1%. In fact, one quarter of all economic activity around the world today is produced by countries whose central banks, their equivalent to the US Federal Reserve, has a negative interest rate imposed in its economy. One quarter of global GDP is being produced by countries whose central banks have negative interest rates. That's a phenomenon that's unprecedented. And the question is, how do you get out of this? And that lack of resolution to that question is again, a factor that's weighing on market participants' minds and what's helping to lead to uh, volatility and gyrations in the markets. But as we think about what the stock market has done, it's clearly had a V-shaped rebound since the lows of February 11 to where we are today. We were at 1,811 on the S&P 500 on February 11. Today we're at 2060, so that's a smart rally, certainly. But what's its cost? The cause was we had comparatively better news started to come out about US economic conditions. We had slightly brighter news coming out of China, and the rest of the world didn't collapse. So collectively, that was enough to turn sentiment about risk assets, about stocks, positive, and therefore you had this rather violent but positive rally in equity prices. The question is, where do we go from here? And the heavy lifting has to come through corporate earnings. And corporate earnings haven't done particularly well over the last 12 months. In fact, just yesterday, a company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, although technically its headquarters is now in New York City, called Alcoa, is always the first company out of the blocks to report earnings. And so we're now in the midst of what we call confession season, which is public companies announcing to investors what their results were for the previous three months ended. And so those earnings at the moment are not expected to be particularly good on a year-over-year -year basis. But expectations over the balance of 2016, and since the stock market is a forward-looking mechanism, where it's attempting to ascertain what's expected to occur six to nine months from now, not six to nine hours from now, is expecting that this underpinning of positive, albeit subpar economic growth, ought to be able to be fertile enough to generate positive earnings growth upon which equity prices, stock prices, can build in advance resume the rally that we had had 
and not have to relapse into some significant material corrective phase once again. And that's our base case at the moment. In the meantime, though, uh, as it relates to fixed income investors, many of which have been accustomed to using bonds either as a mechanism to dial the overall risk down in their portfolios because they're not as volatile as stocks, or the convention was you use them particularly as you uh, age and you move from a period of wealth accumulation to wealth preservation, if not distribution, meaning you're actually using your investment portfolio to withdraw money on a regular basis to subsidize your retirement lifestyle, these instruments have yielded very low levels of interest for an exceeding long period of time. Today, in fact, the 10-year Treasury bond closed with a yield of 1.78%. That's remarkably low. Over history, it's averaged closer to 5%, 5 to 6%. And actually, do we think it's going to go up substantially? The answer would be no. And what would be your context for saying we don't think that rate is going to go up materially higher from here? It's because with all the money that's sloshing around the world today, that's been uh, unencumbered from being invested in some country's bonds by central banks who are buying those bonds in copious amounts to flood the system with liquidity to try to reflate economic activity, we look like a bargain compared to most other bond markets around the world. Today, 51% of the government bonds issued by 19 developed countries in the world trade with a negative interest rate, 51%. Today, the 10-year German Bund, which is a high-quality, sovereign instrument issued by a high-quality country, yields less than two-tenths of one percent. The Japanese 10-year government bond today yields negative one-tenth of one percent. Negative one-tenth of one percent. So, when money can go anywhere to find a home and be treated well by virtue of the interest rate paid on that money, the probability that you get your money back at maturity and it be in a currency that's safe, meaning the U.S. dollar, 1.78 looks rich compared to other bond markets around the world. So that means our market should stay well bid, which means bond prices don't necessarily have to go down even as the Federal Reserve may continue to press interest rates higher in 2016 and or economic activity otherwise would suggest that that 10 year treasury bond yield should drift higher as on the back of faster economic growth, slightly higher inflation expectations going forward. So bottom line for bond investors is that while they're still important, because they're not stocks, so as a governor on volatility in a portfolio, they remain important, but as an instrument to provide you a high or attractive yield, or even a yield that offers you any significant real return over and above that which is lost due to inflation, uh, they're marginal at best. And for cash deposit accounts, those money market and savings accounts that you know you have to look to the right of the decimal point with a magnifying glass to detect the interest rate you're earning on those. Uh, it may have gone up a little bit as a consequence of the Federal Reserve having raised interest rates in, in December, but we think that their probability of raising interest rates twice over the balance of this year maybe is quite high. Uh, three seems improbable, uh, and we think it a non-trivial chance that they only raise interest rates once. So likely, those yields on those short-term instruments like money markets and CDs and those kinds of accounts uh, will remain buried near zero and will continue to guarantee you that you lose money on an inflation-adjusted basis. So coming back around to stocks, do we like any and all stocks? Uh, the answer there would be no. Uh, we remain somewhat uh, defensive relative to a view that is cautiously optimistic. Uh, we think there remains uh, important risks out there uh, relative to a policy blunder on the part of our monetary officials like the Federal Reserve. Um, it could be a situation in which we have a geopolitical risk ignite because of oil, low oil prices or too low oil prices which is problematic for oil producing countries who are exceedingly unprofitable and have enormous budgetary shortfalls as a consequence of oil prices being well below break even and that could create significant social unrest. 
Um, obviously, uh, maneuvers in the South China Sea could create a voluntary or involuntary encounter that would be unwelcome, uh, particularly since it's being engineered by, again, a growing military power in China. Um, and certainly, last but not least, uh, one has to consider uh, a rather cantankerous uh, presidential campaign and uh, what's likely to come uh, out of that, whether we see a brokered convention in Cleveland or what leads us to the White House uh, in November that leaves plenty of opportunity for um, more volatility in the markets going forward. But that said, we think what is most attractive are dividend paying stocks and not just high yield dividend paying stocks, but that is companies who have a historical propensity to not only pay their dividend, but do so through thick and thin and raise their dividend with some degree of regularity. In order to do that, those companies have to have relatively stable, if not at least predictable cash flow to be able to cover their dividend payout policies. In addition to that, it's likely a statement that their management takes seriously their consideration of their shareholders with regard to how they treat the cash flow and profits of that company. And the one of the ways they tend to do that is by virtue of a dividend policy that suggests that they're going to raise it with some regularity. So by way of example, not as a recommendation to purchase, but just to make it tangible, I'm talking about a company like Johnson & Johnson. Uh, you know, if you start today with a dividend yield of 2.5% versus 1.78% on the 10-year treasury, you're putting it in a company in which you have no stated maturity and no certainty you're going to get your money back. But what if we say what if here a little bit and say, do you think that Johnson & Johnson 10 years from now is likely to be selling more Band-Aids or less than today? I think more. I think the world will be more populous uh, 10 years from now than it is today. And Johnson & Johnson is defined as an aristocrat by Standard & Poor's, which is to say it's a company that has actually raised their dividend for at least 25 consecutive years. So not only do you start with a dividend, which represents a yield that's more attractive than the 10-year treasury bond, but you also have a company that over the last five years has raised its dividend at a rate higher than that of inflation, so you get a raise that allows you to maintain your purchasing power, and the chance that you are taking, though, for all of that is that Johnson & Johnson may only sell the same or fewer band-aids 10 years from now, but in the meantime, has a fortress balance sheet, high-quality institution, well-managed, been around for 100 years, figured out how to survive various inclement market conditions, and is likely to in, in the foreseeable future. Therefore, I think it's an attractive bet, and what, that's the kind of company that we're encouraging investors to consider as a way to not only, one, satisfy the income need if you have one, and or two, to combat the uncertainty, the volatility in the market with more stable, more predictably prosperous companies um, that in the event uh, we're wrong, and we'd be happy to be on this account, that conditions improve markedly more than we expect them to, uh, and the U.S. stock market goes on to advance to all-time highs and then some multiple thereof over the near to intermediate term, then you at least were in the stock market, if not in the most aggressive stock that you could own. Um, so with that, I'll uh, conclude the monologue portion of tonight's presentation and uh, invite President of the University to accept uh, any questions from the audience or any that he may have. Dave will pick up questions uh, that you have and uh, get them to me. And uh, while he's doing that, I guess I'll get to stall and uh, ask one of my own. I've been uh, interested in uh, American society for a while, and uh, when I look at it, it seems to me that there are two different uh, world views that sometimes come out, and they're articulated in the election, but I'm not going to ask you back in. Uh, one of those says that uh, the United States is militarily and economically the number one country in the world. There's a little gap between us and everybody else, and what we ought to do is look out for ourselves, make policies and decisions that we think uh, make sense for us. Uh, some recognition about what other people are doing, but we ought to uh, take care of the rest. And there's another that says we really are a multinational world and we are closely bound to other countries 
countries and other societies, and we ought to be doing things in concert with them, and of course, work in relationships with them. When you think about the economic world, which of those world views do you think uh, more aligns with your understanding about economics? Well, it's, to answer your question um, by cheating, it's probably a little of both. Uh, but I would put more weight on the latter rather than the former, meaning that uh, it's actually a little worrisome to hear protectionist comments being made by actually some of the presidential candidates uh, because that harkens back to uh, one of the factors that contributed to the Great Recession back in the late 1920s uh, was protectionist policies as a mechanism for saying we can go it alone, and in fact uh, that proved not to be the case. So I think it's one of those where it, at this point in time, it's partially, it's too difficult to put the toothpaste back in the tube because we're already committed to embracing global economic activity in some way, shape, or form. We are interlinked via financial activity, via trade, that would be very difficult to unwind. Um, and therefore, as a consequence, would be exceedingly problematic for financial markets and I think retard the opportunity for many of our businesses to exploit opportunities in overseas markets, particularly burgeoning develop these emerging market economies that have young, um, highly educated, in some cases, uh, tremendous work ethic populations uh, in which we can help our businesses to grow uh, by having proper uh, trade policies in place that enable us to do that without the threat of empowering these countries to the point where they come back and then through subsidization actually uh, dump products into our market and undermine our competitiveness. Okay, thanks. If you could change the, you're now God, if you could change the U.S. income tax system, how would you change it? Corporate tax, personal tax, whatever. Um, well, it would probably take an act of God to change the tax system, so uh, that seems to be a political third rail. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think on two fronts. Um, you know, and I can yeah, speak, speak my book here on the personal front. On the personal front, simplify the tax code and not invite all the time and energy and expense devoted to figuring out ways to work around the tax system. And I believe there's significant merit in something that uh, a gentleman, for, you know, the editor of Forbes and others have uh, kind of advocated, and, and that's a flat tax system. Um, but in addition to that, and importantly, from uh, a corporate competition standpoint, uh, more favorable corporate tax rates, one that takes into account the loopholes and, and whatnot that can be used as workabouts by our corporations. But clearly, uh, what's prompted, what's served as the catalyst for what now uh, folks like Jack Lou and the Treasurer are attempting to, after the fact, uh, underwrite, uh, which is tax laws that try to address issues um, when they're far down the road, in fact, you know, have already occurred, which is making it troublesome for corporate executives to understand the regulatory, regulatory climate when the rules of the game are changing in the middle of the game. And, and that is to say, uh, make our corporate tax system more competitive. Today, the U.S. at 35% hosts the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. And that's what's prompted these tax inversions. That's what's prompted these corporations to go out and create these mergers, um, not without some strategic merit, clearly, but also with the motivation in mind that by moving from the United States, in the case of a, the most recent one that was uh, actually broken apart, which was Pfizer and Allergan, whereby Pfizer could move from the United States where it currently has uh, a blended 22% corporate tax rate, and by acquiring Allergan, which has uh, a UK domicile headquarters, their tax rate falls to below 15%. The translation is hundreds of millions of dollars of profits that are otherwise going to taxes now stay inside the company. Um, so uh, re remove the, the motivation to do that kind of creative accounting and allow businesses to compete on, on merit, on, on product value added, um, rather than financial engineering. Just don't change the policy to benefit me. Other than that, go for it. <laughs> okay, here's a question you expected. There are lots of questions here. Uh, which presidential candidate will be best for the economy? <laughs> so I'm not gonna answer that <laughs> um, directly. Uh, I will tell you this. 
there is something in the market known as the presidential cycle. Uh, and that is you can look at history and if past this prologue, uh, venture what might occur, which is to say, typically the market in an election year performs rather poorly throughout the beginning of the year into the early summer and rallies rather robustly in the fourth quarter. And that wouldn't be coincidence because it's basically the market hates uncertainty. And at least one element of certainty, whether you like the outcome or not, is in place once the president is elected. So we know at least the, uh, the unknown becomes a known factor. In the first year of a presidential term of the four, that's the worst performing year of the stock market because it's usually when the president comes in and does their best, his or her best, to try to affect their change and, and impart their policies um, in, on, uh, through the administration on the economy. The second year is better, the third year is clearly the best, and the fourth year is the second best um, under any administration. Quite frankly, over history, the stock market has done better under a Democratic White House and a Republican Congress than any other optimal uh, outcome. So uh, that doesn't necessarily say that in this case it would work for Hillary Clinton, uh, but I can say though that uh, the political research that I read uh, suggests that clearly uh, predicated upon the candidate there are outcomes that are going to be imparted, not, no, not necessarily on the market at large, but in sectors of the market, whether you're talking about healthcare as it relates to pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies, financial stocks, the big banks in particular, under further regulatory scrutiny, or managed care or health insurance companies under policies that are going to be devoted to try to at least defang or eliminate uh, the Affordable Care Act. So stay tuned. <laughs> Should we consider a value-added tax? Well, that would kind of fall under something that I alluded to earlier, which is, you know, uh, a flat tax. And, you know, we saw that actually Japan, uh, faithfully, uh, I mean, regrettably, I'm sure, uh, in instituted a VAT tax that had been on the books to uh, come into place. Uh, last year, and it immediately cast the Japanese economy into recession. What it did was that it actually accelerated the economic activity such that the quarter before the VAT tax went into effect, which was in April, economic activity boomed. And it's, it was a result of all the buying was pulled forward into the first quarter. And then subsequently, it dried up. And as a consequence, the Japanese economy uh, actually had an economic contraction, and another one was scheduled 18 months subsequent to that, which means it comes up in 2017. I'm, I'm not a tax policy wonk, so I won't venture any further than that, but I think, again, finding more ways that the energy and, and cost effectiveness of what we do as citizens and taxpayers can be better utilized in figuring out ways to work around uh, current complicated labyrinth tax codes. As a recent college graduate, how risky should I be with my 401k? For that individual, and obviously, you know, prognosis without diagnosis is malpractice. So every individual is different. And so I'm always reluctant because I can say that, you know, Money Magazine would say, to determine how much you should have in stocks, you take 100, subtract your age, and what you're left with is what you should have in stocks. So a 60-year-old should have 40% stocks, a 20-year-old should have 80% stocks. We've had clients who were 80 years old and wouldn't think of owning a bond, and we have millennials that come to us who don't even want to own stocks. So nothing necessarily is you know, homogenous in terms of affecting a prudent uh, and congruent investment policy statement. That said, uh, for that individual who is in a qualified plan that has certain teeth associated with it, which is it's costly to pull out because you have to pay taxes on it and there's a penalty imparted on an early withdrawal before the age of 59 and a half, that individual who is likely not putting in a gigantic lump sum, but rather dollar cost averaging paycheck to paycheck, um, and who has an exceedingly long runway as a college graduate, probably has at least 35 or 40 years before they even consider the point at which they want to begin to withdraw those funds, I'd say be as aggressive as you can be, which is at a minimum be 100% in stocks and at a minimum uh, be tilted towards those areas of stocks, whether it be via exchange traded funds or mutual funds that are the most aggressive and allow for the greatest opportunity for capital appreciation. What are your thoughts on the announced $2 trillion Saudi Arabian mega fund? 
The Saudi Arabian, did I hear you correctly? Yes. So, mega fund. Saudi Arabian mega fund. I am unclear as to exactly what that is. Uh, perhaps the author of that question could answer that more directly. I can speak to, it may be related to this. Um, Saudi Arabia, of course, is a major energy producer that basically rendered OPEC kaput in November of 2014 when it decided to break ranks and not be the marginal supply cutter uh, and instead decided to let the market set prices rather than give up their market share to allow other OPEC members to prosper given the weight of falling oil prices. Uh, they have the luxury, though, at the same time of having the lowest break-even costs among the oil-producing OPEC member nations of about $80 a barrel. In addition to that, while all of these countries have to subsidize their social funding programs with oil revenues, Saudi Arabia has had a $750 billion reserve war chest that they could burn through before they had to go to the market in some way, shape, or form to raise money to continue to balance their budget. They have burned through over 100 billion of that. One of the things they have talked about doing is actually floating an initial public offering of a piece of their privately held oil company, Aramco, their downfield operation, uh, to potentially raise several billion dollars or more in an effort to shore up that reserve fund. So if it pertains to that, it's related to Saudi Arabia uh, thinking about ways to, um, if you will, buttress uh, its reserves uh, in the event it has to stay in the game of allowing the market to set price and not forego market share while it remains exceedingly unprofitable for them to operate at even now. 42 $44 a barrel Brent prices, which is up 50% from the lows in January of this year. What industries are likely to grow over the next 10 years and which ones will not? <laughs> well, that's a, a good question, always a difficult one because you never know what kind of innovation uh, industries may undertake uh, and what kind of a market environment. I mean, you would argue that the utility industry, a highly capital intensive industry, one that's marked with very slow growth, that's why these companies typically are steady dividend payers, but are also highly interest rate sensitive, would, would struggle unless we have a boom in population growth or the economy explodes and therefore there's a lot of residential and commercial construction to which they can sell electricity. Um, I think the secular trends would favor healthcare as an industry because of the aging population, not just in the United States, but on a global basis. Uh, baby boomers, 77 million people, uh, the oldest of which now, born in 1946, uh, is uh, you know over 60 years old, 70 years old at this point, uh, is going to demand, given longer and healthier lifestyles, more product uh, to be delivered out of the healthcare industry, and many emerging markets, including and importantly China, have committed to China particularly in an effort to rebalance its economy to one that's more consumer driven, more support for individual citizens in China, which comes through retirement plan programs, similar to social security and otherwise, and better healthcare. So they're putting massive amounts of money into building out healthcare facilities, and as a consequence of that, um, healthcare operators and medical equipment companies have already started to catch a bit or prosper on some of that sales-related activity, and I think that's a phenomenon that has secular trends. Technology would be another area. The difficulty there is the lack of a barrier to entry to that industry. Um, who knows who's the next Mark Zuckerberg in some garage somewhere, maybe right here in Charleston, that's a future student at the University of Charleston that's working on the next killer app. We don't know that. In fact, that's one of the arguments for maybe why the U.S. economy is undercounting economic activity because how are you accounting for that? They're not showing up in some government report. So there, there is some risk that perhaps productivity and economic activity is more robust than what the statistics lead you to believe. But somewhere in that industry is what's going to be key to not only help to promote, promote productivity, which has been suffering in the United States and the United States, and thwart what people like Robert Gordon and Larry Summers have promoted, which is that the U.S. is facing years, if not decades, of secular stagnation, is what it's called, because there is no new killer app. And I, my argument to that is, 
what, what was fracking? Fracking was a killer act. We had no way to tap these reserves that were either existing but unavailable or didn't even know exist or couldn't get access. And here's a technology that isn't even 20 years old today, and it created a boom in shale drilling uh, that was so consequential that we are just mere years away from being energy independent. Power. Does high-speed trading cause volatility in uh, some of the situations you spoke of where nothing else is changing? High-frequency trading, at least those that are in support of it, argue that it's another source of liquidity for the market. It's another mechanism of buying and selling and therefore is a source of activity. So if you're wanting to sell a stock, they could be a potential buyer, and conversely, if you wanted to buy a stock, they could be a potential seller. So they're another input to being in between that trading mechanism. Um, that said, uh, since many of them are black boxes, uh, are operated using very complex algorithms, and therefore really don't care what it is they own. They're, they're indifferent as to whether it's IBM or Johnson & Johnson. All they care about is nipping a penny here and a, a tenth of a penny over there on being able to get in front of somebody's trade that's crossing a wire faster than they, than they can get to the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I think that kind of behavior is largely unwelcome and actually has promoted some of the volatility and the flash crashes that we've encountered as recently uh, as August 24th of last year, a day in which the market swooned on its open, only to recover most of it by the end of the day, but along the way created massive distortions in share prices that, now I'm kind of aging myself, going to old school days in which you actually had people, live people walking around the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that could intervene on, at times like that and make a market in something whereas machines aren't reading each other and therefore are indifferent to uh, creating a more efficient trading function in days when uh, distortion uh, could be magnified by that kind of machinery operating their, their algos. Do you have any comment or assessment on the EU? For example, uh, Britain's vote this summer. Well, that's uh, one of the risks that I actually had neglected to make mention of, uh, the so-called Brexit. Uh, which is being put to vote on June 23rd of this year, which is David Cameron has put it to the population of, of England as to whether they want to continue to exist as a full-fledged member of the European Union. Um, and at this juncture, uh, as the handicapping goes, quite, fine, quite frankly, it's too close to call uh, as to whether uh, the citizen, citizens of England will vote yay or nay. And so that is a threat. It is mostly, I think, related to European and UK stocks. Um, I think the uh, misunderstood aspect of if it should occur and would then cause a knee-jerk reaction in which uh, the FTSE, the London Stock Exchange equities would fall dramatically, it would be a great buying opportunity because actually most of the companies that are listed on the London Stock Exchange um, aren't even domiciled in London and do very little business in London. They're mostly global enterprises, many of which are, are mining related, in fact. Um, but it would create disruption and take many, many years to unwind the contractual obligations that companies in the, in the countries have between each other. Uh, it would be a mess. It would probably continue to put more pressure, as it already has, on the British sterling, um, and uh, again, uh, probably would cause uh, volatility in European equities until um, you know we fully, more fully understand the consequences. But uh, the smart money is that uh, the UK will stay, uh, but the handicapping in terms of surveys taken of um, citizens is that it remains too close to call at this point. This writer <laughs> makes a prediction that the future world leader in clean renewable energy research, development, production technology will also be the world economic leader. Do you agree? Well, I think ultimately, I think we have a long way to go before renewable and these alternative energy sources uh, are, are so important as to uh, having the country who is the leader in their generation um, assume, you know, kind of uh, global hegemon status. Um, fossil fuels are still uh, too important, are still too widely utilized. 
Uh, and unless we have a shift in our energy policy that basically says we're going to migrate to alternative energy sources, it's going to be very difficult to divorce the public, particularly when gas prices are too low. Uh, as the saying goes, what is the cure to too low of oil prices? Low oil prices. What's the cure to uh, putting to bed or putting to rest fossil fuels? Uh, too low of fossil fuels. So uh, it basically breaks the back of fossil fuel operators. Uh, but in the meantime, the fact that uh, most of the renewable or um, alternative energy industry uh, is uneconomic, only operates because it's being subsidized, uh, doesn't attract tremendous investment, and therefore has a hard time getting traction. Uh, it's growing rapidly from a very small start. Um, I think thematically it's going to create tremendous long-term investment opportunity uh, in some of the renewable energy companies, whether you're talking infrastructure or you're talking for that solar panels. Um, as well, um, and, but it's got a long way to go to be sustainable and economic to the point where it threatens the very existence of the fossil fuel in industry. Do you believe government unemployment numbers? So many experts said they don't, and the phenomenon about not counting people who've given up, etc. These employment numbers. We don't look to the right of the decimal for it in terms of making an interpretation about their value added. Um, there is a lot of questions related to the calculation of those employment numbers, whether it's the seasonality factor that's being applied, the birth-death ratio that's being applied to them. Uh, either way, um, I think it's dubious as to their accuracy to a point. Um, so when we talk about the unemployment rate being 5.0% today, it moved up from 4.9% last month, um, and by most accounts, given the current pace of job creation, it's likely to tri be trimmed down toward 4.8% toward the end of the year. I'm more interested in the move from 2009's 10% level to today's 5% level. That's the signal. The month-over-month -month numbers, whether the number of jobs created were 231,000 or 236,000, is noise. Uh, what is not noise is if it went from 236,000 to 100 or 80,000. Th that's not noise. That's a signal. That's saying that hiring plans have diminished, and that could be the beginning of what then leads to layoffs, which would undermine the strength of the labor market and be a curse on consumer spending and board economic activity. So I'm more interested in orders of magnitude and the directionality rather than how precise or imprecise those numbers are, which for the most part are rounding errors anyway. Is China our biggest creditor? How much do they own? Well, they own a significant amount, although it's falling. Um, they had a reserve account that was about $4 trillion in size of which two-thirds was U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, given the fact that there has been quite significant over the last 12 months capital flight out of China, that reserve fund has fallen about a trillion dollars, closer to three trillion dollars today. Um, and in addition to that, um, the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of China, has been attempting to uh, support the renminbi, uh, the Chinese currency, otherwise known as the yuan, uh, because uh, it was a subject of speculative attack by some market participants who uh, decided to short the renminbi. Uh, and in doing so, they had to raise money. And how did they raise money? They sold treasuries to do that. Uh, so that percentage across a dollar value of reserves that has also fallen has shrunk considerably. Um, but that doesn't mean, though, that we can afford to take our eye on the ball, off the ball, because while the U.S. remains the world's reserve currency, that is the U.S. dollar, um, it's exceedingly important to understand that that's a privilege and not an entitlement, because while that amount in China is still sizable at close to $2 trillion, um, they are making every effort, in fact, they've already accomplished some components of it, which is to include their currency according to the International Monetary Fund, which it voted on positively to allow for, and that is to have the, Ch the Chinese renminbi be considered a world's reserve currency and be part of this special drawings right basket of world's reserve currencies that includes the U.S. dollar, the Japanese yen, uh, the euro, um, the British sterling, and now the renminbi. So it's achieving that status, and it, at the same time, is diversifying away from dollars into things like gold, into euros, 
into other currencies that are considered to be, if not world's reserve currencies, close to, whether it's the Australian dollar or the Canadian loony. So they are already in the process of diversifying deliberately away from their reliance uh, on our U.S. Treasury uh, securities and have made it a point overtly of saying part of the reason is um, their concern about our, our fiscal imbalance. Is raising the minimum wage helpful or harmful to the economy? Well, my reading on the topic from businesses that are encountering that, um, it's a story of a little of both. Um, you have a company, for instance, like Walmart, that has hundreds of thousands of people on its payroll, and it raised the minimum wage to $15. Uh, its stock got crushed as a consequence of that, because needless to say, that's very costly across that sizable of a workforce. But their point was that in order to be competitive, they had to retain and attract workers to compete with other hypermarkets. Uh, whether you're talking Target, who's encroaching on their business, or Costco, or Sam's Club, or whomever. Uh, the flip side of that are small businesses who talk about uh, the, the, uh, the increased cost that they would encounter in a higher minimum wage that would either, uh, again, s uh, soften their competitiveness or um, obviously impact a negative effect on their profitability or margins such that one of two things happen. Uh, they either have to raise prices or in the event that they can't raise prices and most small businesses, at least over the last couple of years, in surveys taken, one of which was just released again this morning, have little or no pricing power um, that means that they, they, and they say this, they aren't going to hire as many people as they otherwise would because they can't afford to. Please explain negative interest rates. Does that really mean that I'm going to pay the bank to hold my money? <laughs> well, theoretically, in its, in its extreme case, yes. Uh, that does uh, mean exactly that. Uh, imagine that you get the privilege of the bank holding onto your money and the dollar that you put in the bank at the beginning of the year, uh, and you go in and at the end of the year ask for it back and you know you get 98 cents. Um, I guess you know, the alternative is you get nothing back, um, but it's not exactly appealing. And so uh, actually a couple of the institutions like the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank, which today host negative interest rates in their respective economies have worked around this uh, concern. Um, one, in the case of the Bank of Japan, uh, they only uh, claim negative interest rates on banks who park reserves at the Bank of Japan to earn a rate of interest. And so why would the Bank of Japan uh, impose a negative interest rate on the reserves that these banks park at the Bank of Japan? And that's to motivate them from parking cash at the Bank of Japan and instead lend it out to try to stimulate economic activity. Um, in the case of, of Europe, uh, they took a slightly different twist with it and they actually said that they will collateralize loans that are taken out by, uh, bank, uh, by customers from banks uh, to the point where actually uh, they will pay them 40 basis points or four tenths of 1% to borrow. So they actually will lend them money and pay them to borrow money uh, as a way to encourage. Even while at the same time, they do impose negative interest rates on bank balances at, at the uh, uh, European Central Bank, uh, substantial bank balances at the European Central Bank. So at this juncture, uh, unless economic conditions worsen whereby they start going deeper across the capital structure of these financial institutions such that these financial institutions have no choice, but rather than subsidizing positive yields to you even while they're paying to park cash at the central bank, have to impose negative rates on your deposit accounts. We're far from that at this juncture. So no threat to the individual at this point. Please comment on the future impact, uh, economic impact of the rapidly increasing national debt and uh, out of control government spending. Well, the national debt today stands at about 100% of our GDP. It's about 18 trillion dollars, 17, 18 trillion dollars, which is about equivalent. Um, by virtue of having the Federal Reserve, our own central bank that has a printing press, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem. 
Uh, and by that I mean it's not a problem as long as someone's willing to step up and buy the treasury bonds that we have to continue to issue on a weekly basis in order to pay for uh, the interest that comes due on this mountain of debt. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a conspiracy that lurks out there that part of the Federal Reserve's reason for holding interest rates as low as they do or, or have is to keep the interest rate on those borrowings exceedingly low. The weighted average cost of capital for that $18 trillion that sits on the balance sheet, the liability side of the balance sheet of the U.S. government is like 1.5%, so it's very manageable. But when you consider among in the federal spending uh, of the total spent, two-thirds is related to either entitlement programs or paying the interest on government debt, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room. And so funding for projects that would return, I think, an, an excellent uh, investment to uh, us over uh, our country over a period of years, such as infrastructure, gets squeezed out if either the interest rate on that debt climbs as a consequence of interest rates increasing or the Federal Reserve having to raise interest rates to attract capital to the United States, or if that debt level continues to balloon and it becomes a bigger portion of total government spending, assuming no cuts to entitlement programs. If that's the case, then those services that are wants and or needs, something has to give in that equation. So that would, uh, I'm sure, be a source of consternation um, on a global basis, let alone have economic repercussions. An investor says, if I'm heavy on bonds right now, would I be well advised to sell some bonds and get into the stock market? Well, obviously not knowing anything about what that individual circumstances, it would be once again improper for me to say, yes, you should, because I know nothing of what your need are or what your risk budget is. Um, just in general speaking, um, in order to move from a heavy proportion of one's portfolio for, that is currently in bonds to stocks, one has to recognize that at a minimum, you're assuming more risk, risk as defined as increased volatility, the likelihood that the variability of your market value, of your return, of your portfolio is going to be greater by some order of magnitude than what it currently is today. Secondly, is that you also give yourself greater opportunity for capital growth uh, in the event that uh, the market begins to improve and uh, a more sustained advance continues from these levels forward. Um, the hurdle rate for equities to outperform bonds isn't that great when yields are 2%. I mean, that, that doesn't require an enormous leap of faith. That said, I will tell you, given current valuations in the U.S. stock market today, uh, if one looks forward uh, from periods in history in which we've had similar valuations in the U.S. stock market, the return assumptions, not for next year, next week, or two years from now, but seven to 10 years from now, are likely on the order of four to five percent. So don't expect that leap to turn into 10, 12, 15 percent. It could, we've had a 15 percent rally in the last two months, uh, but the likelihood of that repeated, being repeated over the subsequent two months is, uh, in my view, uh, quite low. That said, if one's thinking in terms of 10 year time horizons, um, mark down your expectations in a low growth, low return world. Equity should do better than bonds, but the return is going to be muted relative to historical rates of return. Okay, just a few more. When do you see natural gas prices rising? As soon as the supply demand imbalance writes itself. Uh, you know, we're running out of caves and pools to put natural gas at this point in time. So that's the problem, and it's uneconomic at $2 per million BTU. And so uh, it's the same thing for the oil market. You know, the, the cure for the oil market was for oil prices to go low. Uh, and that sounds sort of counterintuitive, but why is that? Why is that? Because production gets killed. So you have, you know, hundreds of rigs uh, being laid sideways in oily states across the United States as they can't afford to continue to operate at $20, $30 uh, West Texas intermediate crude prices. And as a consequence of those supply cuts, we estimated that the oil market would come into balance sometime in the second half of this year. Uh, it's today, of my, my view, that uh, the market may not have yet come into balance. In fact, the global oil supply is still um, 
in balance by about 1 million barrels a day. But I think we've seen a durable bottom in oil prices at this point, such that we don't have to go back to $26 a barrel again. That said, I think the same thing applies to the natural gas market, and that is to say, we need either the consequence of you know, supply diminishing, which seems unlikely at this juncture, more so demand to pick up to consume some of the inventory that exists out there, such that it would be profitable for production to come online. The good news is we have an abundance of it. I mean, the great story, particularly, you know, Pittsburgh's the epicenter of the Marcellus Shale region, which is the second largest deposit of natural gas outside of Qatar in the world. Uh, so this, this is a potential boom for the United States and a component of the whole energy independence theme. But at current levels, and unless there is an, uh, an energy policy that does underwrite the migration to natural gas powered cars and fleets and buses and things that return to a single station like police cars and, and whatnot, then we're saddled with uh, oversupply and as a result, the supply demand imbalance is going to cause prices to remain low for longer. Do you have any thoughts on what might be the impacts or consequences of the release of the Panama Papers? I think that that is more uh, idiosyncratic to those that heard, were involved. Obviously, some high-profile players, uh, David Cameron's father, for instance, uh, there's some allegation that Vladimir Putin might have been close to some individuals that took advantage of the tax loopholes of uh, tax aversion uh, that were uh, made available by the, the legal work of the uh, attorney in Panama. But I think it has, um, if it had any perspective, economic impact of any measured magnitude, uh, the market would have reacted to it and the market yawned. Do you want to add or say anything more specific than you said before on uh, a question which says, what do you see as the impact on US markets and world markets of the election of Donald Trump for Hillary Clinton? <laughs> well, as I said, a little more difficult to measure the impact on the market at large. Clearly, um, there seem to be sectors that may be impacted, although I think on balance, uh, given the fact that at least uh, President Trump um, has uh, suggested that corporate reform, corporate tax reform, would be on his agenda. So probably on balance, the market uh, would react to that positively. Uh, probably on balance, I could argue, now I sound like an, an economist, you know, um, on one hand, but then the other. Um, it, but, you know, Hillary Clinton is more of a known quantity, uh, less variable in style and therefore maybe a little bit more predictable. And I think therefore the market may not like uh, what she may represent, but at least like the fact that they probably, the market knows what it's getting. Uh, but sector-wise, I mentioned before, uh, there's clear uh, views that are being expressed uh, by particularly um, uh, you know, potential presidential um, or presidential hopeful Hillary Clinton that uh, relates to drug pricing that has already, you can see it in the volatility in the healthcare sector and as well in the financial services sector as it relates to uh, continued, maybe even increased uh, regulation coming out of the, the Dodd-Frank provision. Um, last question, what is uh, one economic or investment perspective you want to be certain you communicated that you'd like for us to take away? Well, I think that I often encounter a certain reluctance to accept the view that the U.S. economy is actually doing reasonably well. Um, I know a lot of it has to do with where you sit and how you've been impacted possibly or negatively by conditions in your area. Uh, but my view is not necessarily on a city or state level, but on a, a more aggregate level, either the U.S. or global level, and I can tell you there are some positive developments out there. Um, clearly, this is not uh, the typical post-recession recovery that history suggests we should have experienced. That would have suggested that we'd be having experienced years of four or five percent economic growth and double the rate of job growth that we've had subsequent to the end of this financial crisis. But at the same time, folks like Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt from Harvard, who published a book on it, this time it's different, went back and studied financial crises in history and suggested that the recovery from a financial crisis is much different than one that is a recovery from your garden variety recession. 
because it's typically brought on by over-levered countries, companies, or individuals, and it takes years to deleverage, to unwind that debt cycle. And that's what we're experiencing. So typical recovery subsequent to those kinds of recessionary conditions may be seven to ten years in length. So this is not uh, that much of an uh, is not anomalous uh, given that perspective. Uh, but things are, are, are reasonably good um, and are likely to stay that way as long as um, CEOs and businesses, big to small, uh, remain reasonably confident that they can conduct business in a way that allows them to grow their affairs and continue to hire uh, that allows for consumer confidence to remain intact and that should promote consumer spending which is the key driver to U.S. economic activity. But I think in light of that, uh, that, should, um, that should provide an underpinning for stocks uh, to do reasonably well, perhaps unspectacularly, but reasonably well. Um, and therefore, I would argue that you should not uh, be derailed by bouts of volatility. You should not be shaken out of your equity positions if they're done in proper proportion to your unique needs, uh, given uh, likely uh, situations in which we might encounter over the next 12 to 18 months in which things could look a little grim at points in time. So on balance, I think that's a, a fair, not Pollyanna-ish, but I think hopeful message that I would like. Mark Rossini, thank you for being here. Thank you very much.